In a revealing interview on Face the Nation, Dr. Deborah Burke said that there were COVID deniers inside the Trump White House. She told Margaret Brennan that she knew accepting the role of White House coronavirus response coordinator would probably lead to the end of her career in the federal government. Were there COVID deniers in the White House? There are people in the White House, and I think people around this country, because I've had the privilege to meet them and listen to them and hear them, because I wanted to hear what people were saying. There were people who definitely believed that this was a hoax. Why? I think because the information was confusing at the beginning, I think because we didn't talk about the spectrum of disease, because everyone interpreted on what they knew, and so they saw people get COVID and be fine. So you don't blame the president's own language of calling some of this politically motivated a hoax. It was a phrase he used at one point. When you have a pandemic where you're relying on every American to change their behavior, communication is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. And so every time a, a statement was made by a political leader that wasn't consistent with public health needs, that derailed our response. And this will be the end of your federal career? Yeah, I will um, need to retire probably within the next four to six weeks from CDC. And how have you made peace with that, that this pandemic, that you're leaving in the midst of this, that you will be associated with it? What was reassuring to me all along is I knew this would be studied. I knew that the emails, the reports that I wrote, the request to expand testing, the how to improve therapeutics, all of that, um, all of that would eventually come to light. Yeah, it sounds like De Dr. Deborah Burks was keeping receipts, as they say. Face the Nation moderator Margaret Brennan joins us now with more on the story. Margaret, I have to say, I sat there at my kitchen table. My jaw dropped and my heart dropped as I watched that interview with Dr. Deborah Burks. I've never seen anything like it. Kudos to you for engaging her in that way. I think many people watching thought that she was in between a rock and a hard place. And the more she talked, the more you could see that that was true. But she clearly wanted to set the record straight on her behalf. Did she not? She did. You know, I think all of us are going through this national trauma and trying to process this pandemic. And for those on the front lines who were in the middle of this and the chaotic response, they're still trying to process what they went through, too. Dr. Burke certainly is. We talked to her about that at length. Um, and I think one of the more troubling things was to hear from someone who had dedicated her entire professional career to dealing with pandemics around the world, AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa, was brought to her knees here in the U.S. by a healthcare system that, that leads the way in medical innovation and wealth, but couldn't get out of its own way in dealing with this pandemic, that she uh, really was crippled, she felt, by the chaos inside the White House. But also, as she emphasized time and again, this wasn't just a leadership and personality failure. And, and she lays blame uh, at the White House for a lot of that, but also systematic failures within our healthcare infrastructure. And those are the things, I think, particularly for the medical professionals, that they are raising red flags about. She certainly was here, that there is a lot of accounting to do at the CDC and other agencies so that we don't get hit the next time by the next pandemic the way we are still struggling now. You know, what struck me is when she talked about the parallel streams of information that were coming, that she would often have to do an end run to go directly to the governors, almost saying, Forget what you're hearing up here. Please listen to what I'm telling you down here. I, with someone that had the sterling reputation that she did, how frustrating that had to be for her. Absolutely. And it confirms so much of the reporting to this yes. point that we've had, that we know. Also, I mean, this was something that for the president and those around him, this was a pattern of behavior to use almost wishful thinking to drive policy making, to turn not to the best institutional experts from the inside of the government, but to pick and choose data from those who might be more consistent with your point of view. And sometimes the facts aren't always in your favor or favorable. Uh, and so for someone who's driven by science and data, that's, 
that's inconceivable uh, to her. Uh, and that's what she was expressing. And I think hearing each week that she and a team were crunching these numbers, sending it out to governors, warning them about what was happening in their states, and she doesn't even know if the reports were read by the president. She doesn't know even if the vice president read them, but she knows they were sent to her boss, Mike Pence, by the way, who ran that COVID response. Uh, and, and his staff says they, the staff read them, but they can't confirm that the vice president read each and every one. Margaret, Dr. Dr. Burke said that she constantly considered quitting. Why didn't she? You know, Anthony, this is the question that I keep hearing, certainly in my social media feed. There's so much anger uh, at people like Dr. Burks and others who sat on that COVID team who, who, for, I don't know what people want exactly, perhaps to storm out and say, I quit. Um, but this is something that we hear constantly from the civil servants, the people who aren't necessarily at the stature of a Dr. Fauci who ran his own institution, who couldn't be fired, who has spoken openly about it being conflicted himself, um, but that they felt, well, if I leave, what happens next? And that's why I did ask her, well, did you make a difference? Did staying make a difference? She believes she did. But this is something that I think uh, so many of the people on the inside are going to to struggle with themselves. Um, but for the public, I understand the anger. I think for us as journalists, it's very much worth hearing from people who are on the front yeah. lines so we can better understand exactly what was happening. And that's why the interview was so good, Margaret, because you really took us on the inside. Jerome Adams tweeted this, the former Surgeon General, people so freely suggest they would have left but hold the one woman in the room to a different standard. Do you think that's true? She was held to a different standard because she was a woman? I thought that was an interesting observation. I thought that was, too, from the, the former Surgeon General. And, and he pointed out he felt he was being held to a different standard as well, that mm -hmm. for him in that those tweets, uh, he was the only person of color on that COVID response team. She was the only woman. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I do know that um, it is worth asking that question yeah. of, you know, why do we give forgiveness for some and condemn the others. And I think that broader point of not associating civil servants with politics is important because we need the experts to help us yeah. in moments of crisis. Well, for those who didn't see it, I highly recommend it. It was extraordinary, Margaret, and that's no exaggeration. She talked about tolls taken on her personal life. Really great, great job. Thank you.